Good morning. Uh, I am uh, Joseph Naples, Chair of the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care here at Houston Methodist Hospital. And I have the honor and privilege of uh, interacting and interviewing Dr. Nancy Neusmeyer, who is well known in cardiac anesthesia across the United States, um, as she has been in several institutions uh, where she has held very high positions. She is formerly chair of the Department of Anesthesiology at the Upstate, uh, New York Upstate Medical Center in uh, Syracuse. Uh, she has held uh, positions. She held a position here at the Texas Heart Institute where we are looking across the uh, street here in the Texas Medical Center. She was the head of research for about six years there and she also was there earlier in her career um, before she ended up uh, in, on the West Coast at the University of California in San Francisco. Welcome to Methodist. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the Heart Center, the Grand Rounds. Uh, you also gave a talk to Anesthesiology Grand Rounds yesterday, as well as the Heart Center Grand Rounds this morning. And I your did. topic is very interesting um, because it has to do with communication. Communication in high-risk areas where failure to communicate could result in uh, patient harm. Uh, how, do you, uh, how did this come about, your interest in this area? So um, th this talk emphasized teamwork and communication, although it expanded out a bit from that um, um, into institutional initiatives like team training and simulation training. Um, I am not an expert really in this area based on any research I've done, but um, a group of us were commissioned by the American uh, Heart Association in conjunction with um, several other professional societies, uh, our Anesthesiology Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists, um, the, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, the Perfusionist Professional Society, which is AMSECT, the American um, um, Society of Extracorporeal Technology, and um, also the um, American Association of Perioperative uh, Operating Room Nurses, AORN, uh, as well as actually um, the Human Factors Engineering Society, who have uh, developed a great interest in studying patient safety in hospitals and have kind of focused on the cardiac operating room as the highest um, um, technology and most complex environment um, that they could select. Um, and find a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, we're kind of in our infancy in this field compared to um, the aviation industry, compared to the nuclear industry, compared to the military. And so we, um, we wrote a scientific statement, this group of anesthesiologists, surgeons, perfusionists, OR nurses, and human factors engineers for the American Heart Association and published it in Circulation, uh, which was a comprehensive review of the literature at that time in 2013. So I just learned a tremendous amount about it and had a real opportunity to collaborate with um, a, a variety of disciplines, the ones I just named, um, all of whom are very involved as a team in the cardiac operating room and uh, became pretty fascinated with it thereafter. Now, currently you are still on faculty at Massachusetts General Hospital where you did take your residency. Uh, you've come full, full circle early in Boston, back in Boston, and you're affiliated with an organization where you're a physician editor for Up to Date. I, as an old guy, am not familiar with Up to Date, but uh, I understand all the young people would know exactly what that means. and. Yeah, what all of your current medical <laughs> students, residents in all fields grew up with it. Um, it's, it's been in existence for about 25 years. It really started with um, each of the disciplines in internal medicine, but it's expanded to um, general surgery, not really cardiac surgery, although um, cardiology covers a fair amount of cardiac surgery for up to date. Um, and uh, uh, OBGYN, um, ER medicine, and most recently, we are the 25th specialty anesthesiology in 25 years that we've um, developed um, the specialty so that, so that it's also um, worthwhile um, for 
any of our colleagues to, to search the topic. So it's a 15,000 um, topic clinical decision support resource that's updated daily online. It's not available as a textbook or it's not a journal. It's um, a clinical decision support resource. So I found that here in my questioning of some of your colleagues, uh, just like most places, it is embedded in EPIC um, to help um, the clinicians with clinical decision support. And it's, uh, of course, available through your library here at the Houston Medical Center. It's available in pretty much every academic medical center in most community hospitals in this country. And it's available globally. Um, um, and it, the name of it um, sort of signifies it has something to do with up-to-date medicine, decision making? Well, we update surgical. daily. So, right. uh, you know, journals can't really do that. Textbooks really can't do that. Sure. Part of my job now as a physician editor is to update our topics with the anesthesia literature um, as it comes out essentially daily. Right. Um, and all of my physician colleagues um, working uh, on my floor at Up to Date, which mm -hmm. is right outside of Boston, uh, there are 60 of us physicians are updating their specialties daily. Okay. So it's just a unique model. But is patient safety um, part of the One topic is patient safety, and we've split off, um, or about to split off handovers, which mm -hmm. I didn't have time to cover in my talk, into a separate uh, topic. But right now, it's there's some text about handovers and handoffs in the um, operating room hazards topic and up to date. We have split off uh, medication safety, intraoperative medication safety, which is one of the main sources of errors that anesthesiologists make. So uh, we're constantly developing it. So topics that we had in initially, some of them uh, really could be expanded and we'll split, rather than have a gigantic, you know, 20,000 word topic, we'll, we'll do some splits and amplify some of what we initially did. For instance, I had a topic on cardiopulmonary bypass and that's now split into preparations for cardiopulmonary bypass, management of cardiopulmonary bypass, weaning from cardiopulmonary bypass and problems in the immediate post-bypass mm -hmm. period. So um, none and, of that was available before anesthesiology was developed. Right. And your topic for Grand Round's presentation today as well as yesterday had to do with communication, which may include brief, uh, briefing. Uh, we call a timeout. Uh, World Health Organization has a timeout that's recommended for all surgical environments. Um, how how important is that going forward? Uh, because this is relatively new. 20 years ago, nobody was doing a timeout. In some places, perhaps they are not doing it, although most places have uh, adapted to, the, uh, to that changing environment. How important is that, and where do we go from here with regards to uh, proper communication? Well, um, I was very fortunate to be able to show some movies today um, showing maybe where it's headed. Um, these were um, I have to credit the um, American Society of Extracorporeal Technology, AMSEC, for making these videos and making them available um, because they really want to um, educate teams in the cardiac operating room um, globally. Um, and um, I showed examples of um, how much difference a truly good uh, briefing that goes a little bit beyond a timeout uh, how much difference that could make um, in some situations. Uh, and um, um, I think that is where the field is headed to a more comprehensive briefing, um, usually surgeon-led, but with the participation of every um, team member in the operating room, the nurses, the anesthesiologist, if it's a cardiac case, the perfusionist, anyone else who, who might be involved. Um, to make sure that, that um, everything is as we think it should be, that um, the patient is in agreement with what's going to happen, that all team members have an understanding, a shared mental model of uh, what's about to transpire. It's particularly important in um, institutions somewhat unlike yours where um, unfamiliar team members may be working together every day. You have a tremendous advantage here of having very stable teams of, of people who've been here for a very long time and are, are very familiar with one another and can almost, um, you know, um, um, 
predict you know exactly the next move of 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 their uh, cardiac surgical team member or what the cardiac anesthesiologist should do next. But um, you're training residents. The residents go out into the real world, and um, you have some satellite hospitals. And um, when teams are are not as familiar with one another, working together every day it becomes particularly important. Do you feel that the uh, new trainees, such as residents, fellows, um, seeing these huddles, briefings, debriefings at the end of procedure as something that's really important going forward uh, compared to trainees that came through 20, 30 years ago where this was never done? Um, well, not just the trainees. I mean, <clears throat> I've been exposed where, you know, for many years I was in, you know, institutions like, like I, no one was doing this type of thing. Um, having um, now been in an institution, um, uh, and that was Mass General, where they do it very, very well and take it very seriously, where the entire team has bought into the concept and uh, has done the adaptive work um, and are true believers, not just the rote technical um, checking off boxes of a checklist. Um, I've been very impressed at what I've learned that I didn't know, you know, might transpire um, for the case um, by participating myself in those morning huddles before every case. Um, and I think, you know, virtually everyone, the um, experienced clinicians and the new trainees um, come to feel that there, there really is opportunity for improvement. Um, and that it really is valuable. Yeah. And perhaps yields patient safety over the long haul? Improves patient safety? Well, there, are, there are studies, and I flashed a few of them up in you know, the limited time mm -hmm. we had sure. for one lecture that, that do show um, um, improvements in outcome, mm -hmm. but only really if, if the team has bought in and done the adaptive work. Mm -hmm. um, there are other studies that show like partial implementation um, of a checklist um, where it's sloppily done, doesn't generate the same benefit in terms of over a long period of time and thousands of patients actually improve, improving outcome. Yeah. Uh, I gleaned from your talk that the words, let's say, um, huddle, briefing are probably better uh, as a concept rather than just checklist, which might right. be just checking boxes. Right. So. A, a standard checklist <clears throat> used in many places is the World Health Organization checklist, and it does have some of the components of a briefing. Um, there is some opportunity for interaction, not just checking the boxes, um, both at the beginning and then at the end of the case, there's even a little bit of an opportunity for a debriefing mm -hmm. to make sure that everything was completed and to find out if there were any um, equipment um, or other issues in management of the case. and so. Um, um, you know, even a standard checklist can be adapted to have some components of a, of a briefing. Mm -hmm. But um, I think as you saw with the lecture this morning, the more um, opportunity there is to really identify potential inconsistencies, uh, missing equipment, uh, misunderstanding on the part of a team member regarding what's going to be done, the more you can identify that and deal with it before it happens, um, um, the smoother the case goes and mm -hmm. the more likely the patient is to have a good outcome. Right. And I think that's what we're all about is just improving outcomes over time. Dr. Neusmeyer, thank you so much for honoring us with your um, expertise. Um, your, the lectures that you gave, we're happy to have you visit our institution and to be able to visit Houston again, where you did spend uh, two segments of your career, along with several other prominent institutions across the United States. We were so pleased to have you for the uh, Heart Center Grand Rounds. Well, thank you. I was very honored, and it was just a fabulous, amazing opportunity to see uh, many old friends and, and my colleagues uh, from a not-so-distant past, so I very much appreciate the invitation.